Yo, have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome everyone to the L7C Podcast Women's Gymnastics Edition. Today, right on the heels of the Women's NCAA Championship that just concluded yesterday, and we are recording the day after on that Sunday. If you guys didn't watch it, we're going to recap it for you guys. It was a spectacle. The final four teams really put on a show with the lovely gymnasts and their athleticism and all of that. But I'm not the expert in women's gymnastics. Sarah Bogan is. How are you doing today, ma'am? Oh, gosh, I'm doing so well. Um, you know, like you, like you said, um, we're coming off on the heels of a really, really exciting national championship. So I'm kind of reeling from that and also coming down quite a bit. And in addition, I filed my taxes right oh. before. I oh, jeez. So that <laughs> stress, <laughs> that stress has also been lifted from me, so. Filing the day before they're due. Oh, that is. Yeah. Grad school. It, it keeps you busy in some very stressful ways. So. So first off, the final four teams I got here, Oklahoma, Florida, Utah, Auburn. If you're following the L7C on Twitter or seeing some of the tweets, uh, Sarah did have her bracket out for the preview show. And there was one team that was there that wasn't in the final four. And that was Michigan. Who's been a top team all year. Yeah. Reigning yeah. national champs. Reigning national 2000, champs. 2021 champs. First time champs. I had them on my, as my repeat national champion on my bracket. Mm-hmm. Um, they were ranked number one, you know, for most of the season and then kind of were overtaken by Florida and Oklahoma. But we talked about on the last podcast about how, as, as far as talent level and potential, those three teams, it could have been either one of them on the day. But Michigan had a very, very rough semifinal um, at 6 p.m. on April 14th. So the, again, just to recap the um, format of the finals um, of the national championship. So regionals were two weeks ago, which we recapped already. Um, mm-hmm. The top eight teams made it through to nationals and then there were two national semifinals so michigan was competing against auburn florida and missouri and the second semifinal and florida and michigan were pretty much expected to make it through really easily however a couple things happened one is that florida or that auburn just had an incredible day you know this is the best they've done auburn has in a really long time and they were riding the high of that um, and of course, the high of the SUNY effect that's been boosting them throughout the entire season. And Michigan opened the door in a really, really big way. So they were right there in the mix for the first two rotations. For, so for the for full half, first two events of the entire semifinal, they were doing really well. But then they stumbled, stumbled on bars. And so their first athlete fell on uneven bars. Um, and that, of course, put a lot of pressure onto the rest of the lineup because you can only drop one score. And so close to the end of the lineup, um, they had another fall. Someone hit their foot on the bar, fell on her dismount. So that was pretty, uh, pretty tragic, pretty um, a bummer for them. And then they went immediately to finish on beam. 
And beam is one of the worst events to do if you're nervous and you have a lot of pressure on you. And so there was a fall on the dismount from their first beamer um, and the wheels just kind of continued to fall off from there. And they ended up um, finishing with the lowest score out of all of the semifinalists in both sessions. So after being national champs last year, they finished the regular season in eighth place. So just even looking at like your final four that you had, because you had Florida, you had Oklahoma, you had Utah. The only one that you had wrong was Michigan. Unfortunately, you had Michigan winning it all. So it just like cut yes. that up. My, but but uh, bracket has been busted. But Team War Eagle, the SUNY Lee effect, Auburn took that spot. And I know from, I think from a casual uh, gymnastics fan standpoint or someone who just was tuning in on the Saturday. I think Auburn making it in did a little bit better for like ESPN's ratings and all that stuff because they have the gold medal Olympian on that team, as we've been saying all since you've started these podcasts, the SUNY Lee effect. So I think that was good for, I mean, I, I kind of want to miss, uh, makes it gross to say, but from, <laughs> a, from a big 10 perspective, having, one in there because having two sec teams that just makes my big 10 skin crawl but utah did make it so i know your yes. region like your area over there so that was nice yes go pack 12 and i actually you know i mentioned i've been to a couple of utah meets this year and i was just kind of feeling this weekend i've somehow ended up as a utah fan uh, so i was really really pulling for utah it's another team that has a lot of legacy. They've won a lot, but they haven't actually won a national championship since 1995. So they've been a top team for a long time, but they haven't been at the very, very top in over a decade. So then how do the individual uh, titles get won? Because before Saturday, the individual champs were already decided and just want to highlight her. Trinity, Tom- Trinity-, Trinity Thomas. Three of them, bars, yes. floor, all around from Florida. Like she, I was watching her and I was just like, oh my gosh, she is just dominating. Yeah, she really cleaned up. Um, so Trinity has had quite the journey in her NCAA career. She did have a really illustrious elite career. Um, I don't think she ever made any world teams or anything. She was always just kind of right there um, in terms of being an alternate. Um, but she's been a really, really reliable NCAA gymnast, and she wasn't on too many people's radar too much, especially earlier this year, because she just wasn't in the lineups very much. Um, she missed most of the postseason last year because she had a really bad ankle injury right at the end. Um, but kind of a bit midway through this season, she started competing a lot more. And just uh, I think you actually sent me a video you saw, Martin, of her getting her perfect 10 on Volt. Mm-hmm. And so she actually, she's an amazing all around gymnast, but didn't actually compete the all around enough this year to have a ranked spot in um, the all around because she didn't get that individual national qualifying score, which again, you need six scores throughout the season to do. So she didn't come in to the national championship ranked um, like a lot of other folks were. Um, so in that way, she was a little bit under the radar, but people who knew gymnastics knew to watch out for Trinity. I mean, three titles. That's, I don't, I don't know if you can be under the radar anymore after no. getting three and then SUNY won beam and then Jaden Rucker won the vault. So again, yes. like how are those decided before oh. the national championship? Yes. So like I mentioned, the, um, the national championship weekend takes place over the course of two days. Mm -hmm. So on Thursday, there were the semifinals. So for the team championship, there were four in each. And then the top two from each went on to the final four on the floor. So that day of competition, the semifinal day of competition is what determines the individual titles. So in addition to all eight of those teams competing, Mm -hmm. uh, quite a few individuals that also qualified out as individuals from regionals to nationals and were there without teams also competed. So that's how we were able to see Jade Carey, Mm -hmm. um, who ended up getting, I think she came in fourth in the all around Jade did. Um, But yeah, so Jade Carey was there as an individual without Oregon State. 
So basically everybody competes on semifinal day. And um, at the end of the day, they look at all of the scores from both sessions and do their rankings for championship and individual honors based on that. Gotcha. That makes more so, sense. That makes more sense. So going into Saturday, it can be though, a little stressful and anti. Yes. I was just going to say, like going into Saturday, didn't mean to cut you off. Like when you saw those four teams, who did you think was going to win it all? Oh my gosh. I believed that it was going to be Florida's to lose just because they have been so, so strong in postseason. Um, and Trinity Thomas just herself has been on fire. I think something notable about Trinity um, is that she got, she got at least one, she got 110 yesterday mm -hmm. um, on floor. And then she got also at least 110 during the semifinal. And that's really, really hard to do at national championships because at nationals, there are six judges. And so six judges judge your routine, the highest score and the lowest score is dropped in the middle four are averaged. So in order to get a perfect 10 at nationals, five out of the six judges minimally need to give you a 10. And so like just the fact that she was able to do that multiple times this weekend was incredible. But um, in addition to that, there were quite a few super seniors um, who were big players for Florida. Um, I want to give a shout out to Megan Skaggs, who has just had an incredible career. Um, Alyssa Bauman is another fifth year senior at Florida who's just been incredible at having a dream season. And um, then they have that freshman class. They've got Leanne Wong, they've got Riley McCusker. Eventually they're going to have Morgan Hurd. And so they just have so much star power and so much talent. And based on their regional performance, it looked like they were going to be unstoppable. Um, so I really was expecting Florida to pull it out. But as Oklahoma showed us and reminded us, you could never count Oklahoma out when a national championship is on the line because that team knows how to perform under pressure when it really counts. So a couple of things I want to say about that Saturday thing too. One, thank the stars. It was on ABC because yes. more, because I'm not going to lie, it being on like, having a whole tournament on ESPN plus, I just don't think that's good exposure for the sport just because a lot of people aren't paying for ESPN plus. So of course you exactly. got to go to your different sites, yada, yada, yada. But for your whole tournament, besides the final like four to be on ESPN plus, I feel like they need to change that. There's a whole bunch of ESPN networks they have on cable or streaming services, or just should have just kept on the ESPN app instead of making people pay for it to watch so on the saturday when it was on abc and it was on espn plus where you can see each team's perspective that was really cool i think they should adopt that for the whole tournament not just the final four what are your thoughts oh i fully agree like i said um i think i mentioned this before even before this year there was barely any coverage of the regional rounds, especially the regional semifinal rounds before this year. So like for us to even have ESPN plus and have that consistent coverage for regionals was a really big deal for gymnastics fans. But I think, yeah, a lot of people agree that like um, gymnastics has shown again and again, that if it's accessible, people are going to watch it. And like women's sports aren't, and like, like they're not a liability they're not a charity they're an asset you know i think more people would watch if they could so i don't buy any of that like oh if we put it on abc nobody's gonna watch it nonsense you know it's it has the potential to be a really big sport yeah because like i sent you the picture too because i'm a huge basketball fan mm -hmm. i had nba playoffs were starting same exact time at the nba really? playoffs i oh yeah i was at one o'clock too but I had the playoffs <laughs> on my iPad and I had the championship on the, on the big screen. Cause I was just like, it's the championship. Like the playoffs are just starting. This is a championship. This we're going to get a champion. It's on ABC, like, you know, helping the viewership and all that. And I liked it. I mean, I really enjoyed I sat there, watched the whole two hours, didn't like change channels or anything. It was really, really entertaining from start to finish. There was all these twists and turns with the scores and all that. 
Can you explain for like the people the rotations? Because like after first one rotation, I think Auburn was ahead at the first one, then or Utah was, or however it was, then Oklahoma and Florida started going back to back. Then it was the fourth rotation, and then Oklahoma pulls it out by the skin of their teeth almost. How do those like what's a rotation? Yeah, so a rotation is essentially one event. So there are four events in women's gymnastics. And so in order to finish the meet and complete the meet, you have to go through all four events. So one rotation is basically one team on each event. And at the end of that rotation, everybody has completed one event. Oh, okay. So how do you do strategically then? Like, since there's four, do you try and manipulate who you want going when on what rotation do you save your best for last? Do you just start off with a bang and have your best person go first? Like, what do you do strategic wise? Oh, yeah. So different teams have different strategies. The um, overall strategy that a lot of teams try to use is they'll start with somebody who's usually really solid and can set the tone. And then ideally, they want to try and build the scores as they go on. Um, so a lot of times the last performer, the anchor is going to be who they expect to be their highest scoring person. There's also all sorts of psychology where, um, there's an understanding that the judges are going to expect that in ascending order as mm-hmm. well. So sometimes they'll put stronger people in the middle of the lineup to try and boost the scores as they go on. So sometimes you'll see the highest scoring individual in the fifth spot instead of the sixth. And we saw Florida do that in their floor rotation. They put up Trinity Thomas in spot five and um, I forget who they put up in spot six, but Trinity was their big player. Um, And so they put her in spot five and that helped to boost score as well. So yeah, but it kind of depends on the team um, and depends on the strategy. There are all sorts of mind games. You can play with the judges and score ascensions and everything, but Also, ideally, judging should be totally objective. So in theory, it shouldn't matter what order you go up in. um, But in practice, it does. And uh, there are different strategies of playing that system. So then, like, when when it came down to the final rotation, were you still thinking Florida was going to pull it off? Or were you like, ah, this is this is going to be Oklahoma's time? So I think. Thought hmm. so after after two rotations. So after three rotations, um, I believe Oklahoma was in the lead by two tenths, which in NCAA gymnastics land is a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but Oklahoma had just come off of their best event, uneven bars, which they they were ranked number one in the country, and they had just an amazing rotation. Like when I saw them do that bars rotation, I thought, wow, this could be Oklahoma today. But bars was Oklahoma's absolute best event. And I knew that. And Florida was about to go to floor. And that was one of their best events. So I knew that it would be tough for Florida to make up the difference of two tenths, but it was possible. So yeah, going into the fourth rotation, I basically thought it could either be Florida or Oklahoma. Um, and, and by then, you know, Auburn and Utah had already fallen yeah. out of it a little bit. Yeah. At that point they were, they were out. Um, and then Oklahoma does win and it's their fifth title. Yes. From, from what I saw, it was their fifth title. And then when they were talking to the coach, uh, KJ Kindler. Yeah. Oh, I, six. It was their sixth title. Actually, they've won five time. times before. Five times. So it was yeah. their sixth title, but it was KJ's fifth title as the coach. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, and then they were saying like she's been coaching since 2006 and she has five titles. My biggest thing when they said that, and I was just like, Florida's, why isn't KJ being talked about more in regards to like some of the best college coaches in the game right now in all of sports? Like you had Gino for UConn women. You had, he just retired coach K for Duke. Like you had Pat something like you had all these coaches. KJ has five titles in like since 2006 and is looking like her titles were 2014, 16, 17, 19, 
and now 2022 10 top three national like i had to just really research this one i was like she has five titles and she is not talked about as one of the best coaches in all of college sports and why is oh and also nick saban but why is why is she not talked about like that like she deserves it i know i know it's crazy like and there are i mean like i think the gymnastics effect is one aspect like gymnastics just isn't as well followed and well renowned as a sport as other sports are but there are like greg marsden was a legend uh when he coached utah miss val at ucla was a huge personality and a huge you know coaching legend i think kj I'm, within the college gymnastics community um and the gym internet kj is definitely renowned and respected I have a couple different speculations about why I think one is that Oklahoma is in the Big 12 and the Big 12 just isn't a very big gymnastics conference. There are only four four teams in the Big 12 that do gymnastics. And you know, like the SEC in contrast has a really rich, really strong history of gymnastics. They're really good at promoting their gymnastics and the Big 12 doesn't do that as well. You know, Oklahoma also, you know, a point of discussion on the gym internet lately also has been that Oklahoma at their home meets they don't necessarily bring as big of crowds as come out to Utah meets and Georgia meets and Auburn meets now. And like I think the team itself despite being really really popular hasn't generated the same kind of buzz and excitement as other college programs really have. Um so I'm kind of curious to see um with I'm not sure if you're following the storyline of Oklahoma getting ready to join the SEC in a couple of years. Uh, yeah, I'm that's a whole yeah from yeah <laughs> during college football where they're like Oklahoma and Texas are going and I from a and at that point it was only a college football college football perspective. I was like I still don't understand why they're going i understand it starts with m and ends in o and e y but, yes <laughs> but from a competitive thing i i don't know about that but now that you've said it it's the first time i've actually thought about all of their sports like is it yeah. just because at that point i'd only thought it was their college football teams entering the sec i didn't think it was i have not thought about all their sports and now you say it from a gymnastics thing like oklahoma being there with florida auburn all that but i want to go back to you said something about them not being like it's popular bringing in the crowds is that how much of that though is school advertising getting the word out like that type of thing because i feel like those things can be rectified to an extent if you get if you put the money into advertising the team and things like that this woman is a multiple time champion like they are bringing in titles to the school so I, they gotta put more emphasis on their program if she's out here winning titles almost every two years 14 16 well 16 17 was back to back 19 22 almost every two years she's bringing in a title in this stretch yeah yeah i'm not sure what's going on at oklahoma and like what the athletic department is putting in but i do know that historically schools have just invested less in bringing people out to gymnastics meets and the most successful teams in terms in terms of you know building up a fan base and bringing them in have been a product of head coaches working really really hard to do that so like one of the things that Jordan Weber we've talked about her a little bit mm -hmm. at Arkansas when she started at Arkansas she made it her business to try and pack the arena as much as possible and so she you know Olympic champion Jordan Weber was baking cookies and going and knocking on all the sorority house doors and saying, please come to one of our meets. And she was doing the legwork and she was calling season ticket holders. And um, I do think the schools tend to support gymnastics well once that fan base is built up, but you see very little of that coming from the sport schools in general. Um, I'm looking at road to nationals right now. And so in addition to all their other incredible stats on every team they have, um, they have home attendance listed. Um, and so I'm looking at just Utah, for example, their average home attendance at meets this year was 11,595. 
which isn't as high as previous years. They usually, they can pack as many as 15,000 people into their arena. But looking at Oklahoma, their home attendance on average has only been 4,926. So still like respectable, but like not even close to the most popular teams. So I'm not sure what's going on in Norman, but I think there is potential definitely to build up that viewership and build up that fan base quite a bit more. That's yeah, because if you got a woman who's leading teams, I guess also too, where it was a interview I was listening to with the head coach of everyone knows this Netflix show now, liking cheer, not cheer, mm-hmm. like from a cheer, like from that perspective. And the interview was asking, it's like, why are you not talked about like with one of the greatest like coaches of all time? She had like X amount of titles and whatnot. And obviously Netflix is helping mm-hmm. too. So I think now like with all the stuff, name, image, and likeness, like you just talked about, like Olympians doing the stuff, like all these ladies, the athletics staff and all that, they need to promote this because she's not going to be around forever. So you got to enjoy this golden era of titles you are getting or guaranteed final four finishes almost every year that she's been coaching. So I just really wanted to highlight coach KJ, but yeah, KJ is great. Now with the season over, Oklahoma's the champs. Mm-hmm. What's what's next? Like, how is this off season going to be going? How does, I know Michigan, they are super disappointed that they didn't oh make gosh, it this yeah. far. Florida's super disappointed disappointed that they've lost like what is next for these top teams i guess i'll do three things one what's it take for what's it going to take for oklahoma to repeat obviously there's months away two what's it going to take for florida to if they have a rematch beat oklahoma if that happens three what's it going to take for michigan to get back to the final four? Oh gosh well i can tell you a couple different things um one is that um on the gymnast level on the most basic individual molecular gymnast level what happens in the off season is everybody rests a little bit but pretty quickly they get back into the gym and off season is when gymnasts start really working on upgrades so during the season when they're competing all of the time they're basically sticking with the same routines Mm -hmm. but if they want to improve their difficulty or tweak their routine or add something add connections add higher level skills that'll get them better scores that's work that needs to be put in in the off season i think auburn is a team that could benefit from increasing vault difficulty um, so they have a quite quite a few um, 9.95 start level start value vaults where the top score that they can get if they do it perfectly is only 9.95 instead of 10 because they just don't do difficult enough vaults. So that's one way to start, you know, bringing in more difficulty is, you know, getting those 10, 10 start value vaults. Another thing is that there's going to be um, teams you know, graduating and bringing in new, new individuals. Um, I don't have the freshman class for each team for next year in front of me yet. But in terms of new talent coming in, the influx of talent this year overall isn't going to be as high as it was this past year. So the season immediately following the Olympics always has really high freshman star power in it um just because that's when most gymnasts choose to make their transition into college is after an olympic cycle so one thing to look at i mean of course there are like really strong talents coming in to watch for oklahoma always does a really good job at um recruiting kind of the lower level elite gymnasts and the level 10 gymnasts who are really really good but most people aren't expecting them to be really good so that will be cool to see what kind of level 10 step onto the college scene and really take over um another thing to watch for is um what's called the sophomore glow up so Mm -hmm. we had a massive amount of talent in the freshman class this year not all of that talent reached its full potential because that's just 
the nature of moving away from your home, starting college, starting a different style of gymnast gymnastics. So we definitely haven't seen the best from Riley McCusker yet at Florida. She's, you know, beautiful, but she hasn't been the star yet that I think she's capable of being. Sloan Blakely is another freshman at Florida who, you know, was good this year and contributed to the lineups, but can be even better. And then, of course, there's Morgan Hurd, who has been injured all season, red shirted, but she's going to be a big talent for them. Yeah, so the freshman classes, keeping an eye on them, keeping an eye on who upgrades what. Um, and then another big question mark and something to watch for in the off season is which seniors decide to take a fifth year of eligibility. So the 2020 to 2021 season, everyone who competed that season is being granted an extra year of eligibility if they want it. Hmm. So um, there are some seniors this year who announced that they're planning on coming back, but you know, that decision-making progress process is still up in the air. So what the lineups are going to look like for next year, are kind of not too certain for any team because of all of these, all of these forces at play. So, yeah. Um, I think Michigan, I'm sad talking about Michigan because Michigan already has a few fifth year seniors who came back and they are a team that doesn't have a lot of depth. Um, most of their teams come from four individual gymnasts. I think they're going to have a lot of rebuilding to do after this year, um, which is kind of a bummer to see because they've been so good in recent years. Um, but Florida, like I said, they had a lot of strong seniors this year. Trinity Thomas has the potential to come back. We're not sure. And they have that really strong freshman class. So, yeah, I think stock is up Florida. I think Oklahoma always has strong gymnasts coming in. And Auburn has a lot of growth that they can do with adding difficulty and um, improving their recruitment. So, yeah, we'll see. So with it being now like the off season, just from a normal college perspective, do high school um, gymnasts who are coming up to college, do they have like a national signing day where they have to sign their letter of intent to be gymnasts by a certain day? Like when, when do they have to be like, if someone who is highly recruited right now, she hasn't graduated yet because we're in April and usually high school is May, like in middle, like beginning of June. Mm -hmm. When does she have to decide where she's going to compete at? Let's see here. I believe it tends to happen sometime in November. Okay. So November 11th, November 10th, it's around that, that time. So usually those signings will happen the year before. So the signings for next year, um, the National Letter of Intent Day happened roughly um, somewhere in November in 2021. So um, there are a lot of people who already decided where they're going to go to college. And, you know, that's just kind of consistent with, you know, when high schoolers decide where they're going to go. Um, but there is, you know, late signing that happens. So. Yeah, I'm not sure. And like I said, the incoming freshman class for next season is just lower profile overall because all of the elites tend to come right after the Olympics. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know. That's one one thing I don't know too much about yet is what next year's freshman class is going to be like. No, um, the, the, this year's was kind of stole the show quite a bit. With this season coming to an end in Oklahoma winning, how would you describe this season like did it meet your expectations did it go above your expectations like how would you describe how this season ended hmm. i would say i think with all of the hype and with more reigning olympic medalists coming into ncaa than anybody else and having soon on the floor you know it's just so huge i think it met the expectations in a lot of ways, you know, I think there's been a great 
media presence and excitement for the sport that I haven't seen quite yet. So in that way, I think as a sport and as, you know, a viewer, the experience was absolutely, you know, it it met or exceeded my expectations for what I thought it would be. Um, For individual teams, you know, there are certain teams that I was really disappointed in. I was really thinking Minnesota could break through this year. I was definitely hoping Michigan would have another good year. But overall, I was very happy with how postseason went. And then I think like on a personal level, I just like, especially after watching so many meets just in my parents' basement during COVID last year, Mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to go to so many meets this year and getting to meet my team and getting to meet the coaches of my team and going and seeing so many uh, really cool meets in person at the University of Utah and with Utah State. I think like personally, my experience as a fan has just gone to a new level this year. And I kind of hope that continues. But yeah, I think the um, the sport is growing and I think it's exciting. Um, and I've kind of enjoyed growing my own passion for it as well. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up Oklahoma's 2022 NCAA championship? Well, I guess I'm curious to know for you, did you have any, you know, like we can talk about stats and sort of sorts of things, you know, a lot, but did you have any like moments of like joy you remember from watching the championship or routines that you saw that just blew you away or took your breath away. I'm kind of curious about like the nitty gritty of actually watching the sport. Like what moments stuck with you? There was a lot of moments where obviously like I wasn't paying attention to the like grade some of the ladies were in, but I just felt mm-hmm. like I could tell who was a senior and who was in stuff like that. Because obviously when you're a senior, it's, in any sport, high school, like this is it. This is your last. You don't get, oh, we can have till next year. No, you don't get that. So this is it. So like mm-hmm. seeing the people like focus. And there was a lot of routines where I think Trinity was one of them where like she got super hyped and she was saying like, let's go. And, like there was other ladies who were like getting hyped when they landed their stuff. And, like that got me hyped because I could just tell how passionate and how dedicated they are. And like when they were going, let's go. And I was going, let's go, like, just for, like, those sheer, like, moments. And then there was just the times where it was just, like, how sports can just be, uh, we talked about the stats, can be decided by, like, um, one mistake. And there were times where a couple ladies on the uh, all-around, I think, or on the floor routine, they laid it out of bounds. There was a couple stumbles. And it was just, like, oh, that's, and I felt for them, too, especially if they were, like, seniors, because I was, like, you do not want your last routine you've ever done in college to end on a mess up. And even if you're a freshman, cause you're just like a freshman, you don't know any better. And you're just going to be, you're like, Oh, I'll come back next year. But it's like still staying. So it was like the overall event was, I was really, really into it, especially for the fact that it's a very easy watch too. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think people realize that it was like two hours, but it didn't feel like to me, it was two hours. And there was just a lot going on. Like, going to this event, going to this event, going to this event. Oh, Trinity's there. So she's going to get the focus on that or SUNY's up. So she's going to get the focus on that or the Olympians talking about how like they're all competing against each other at different schools. That was cool to see too, that little thing where they showed mm-hmm. all the Olympians in their different uh, gym, like uh, school uniforms talking mm-hmm. about like, oh, well, when so-and-so got a perfect 10, it was crazy because then the next week, this one got a perfect 10 and like, we're all competing against each other, making each other better. So I, I was just a really, really cool thing to watch and like seeing the teams and seeing the people compete, seeing the fans com- like get into it. My only question is, I don't understand why the dude from The Bachelor was there. I didn't know if he went to Auburn. Oh. <laughs> like, oh, I, was okay, conf- yes. I was confused. Or if he was an alumni, if he donates money, if he actually yeah. has a kid who competes. But then, then it makes sense to me age-wise. Oh, okay. but. So this is this is the reason. I can't I can answer that question. Um, he was wearing the Auburn dad. Yes. Shirt, so 
Matt James. So for people who don't know The Bachelor, so Matt James was the first Black Bachelor. Mm -hmm. um, and he was actually there watching with his um, final pick, Rachel Kirkconnell. Um, but Matt James is a big fan of Auburn Gymnastics because he and Suni were actually on Dancing with the Stars last season together. Ah, there's the connection. Yes. Okay. So that, that's why. So he's there with his Auburn dad shirt supporting Suni because they got to be really close on Dancing with the Stars. All right. I really thought he had like a kid on the team that, but then I'm like, I mean, he kind of does. It's Suni. <laughs> but I was like, I know people who watch The Bachelor. And I was like, hey, tell me what this dude's doing here. And all of them was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I was just like, but no, it was really, it was a really cool championship to watch. And it makes me like excited to see, like, watch it again next year. Yeah. It happens every year. It's really amazing. So, um... yep. my only complaint, though, they need to broadcast the other now they need to step it up and have them on other chain there's espn u there's espn two there's all the other espns that are on cable you can find a way to put some gymnastics meets on there so i don't have to pay for espn plus just to try and watch one. Oh, definitely and i there are many many people greg marsden storied coach at utah who built the program mm -hmm. is now retired he loves to tweet about how many things need to happen in order to step up the coverage of college gymnastics. So highly recommend following Greg Marsden on Twitter for more uh, solidarity with those thoughts. Anything else? Oh my gosh. That's all just like, I'm really grateful for the LC7C fans and listeners for taking this journey with me this season. Um, Cause like I said, I've been a gymnastics fan for a long time, but this year for a lot of reasons my fandom and my joy for the sport has ex like just exploded even more and so it's been fun to have you all on this journey with me and i hope um there are at least a couple of more people out there who are more excited um, and more willing to check out college gymnastics especially women's college gymnastics because it is very much worth the watch absolutely with that being said thank you everyone for listening to the lcc podcast thank you sarah for becoming our women's college gymnastics expert. You've been a fantastic addition to the L7C and all the different podcasts we do. And it's, and you having on has made me pay attention even more to gymnastics, like watching, mm -hmm. learning the stats, learning most of the rules. And it just was a great experience. And I can't wait to continue on with the women's gymnastics journey. Yes. With that being said, thank you everyone for listening to the L7C Podcast, signing out. Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C Podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.